All right, get your Bibles. 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we're going to cover all 23 verses, but I want us to begin reading verses 14, 15, and 16 as today we look at when David danced. Did you hear that? Danced. You're in a Baptist church and the preacher said danced. Come on, amen. When I was a kid, I got my theology from two great places. Early on Saturday morning, I'd watch those people gyrate on Soul Train. Can I get an amen right there? And then later that night, I'd see those hoots try and dance on hee-haw. How I many you know it's mixed up? Amen. So David danced, and I want you to look at it. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. Notice what it says. It says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting. And with the sound of the trumpet. And the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Our Father, we are grateful for the word of God that is right and true and inerrant. God, it's been preserved for us today. God, the very example that we're going to read about, you left it for us on this Sunday morning. God, I pray we'd take the admonition of the Word of God. We'd not just be hearers, but God, we'd be doers of the Word. God, I'm glad today you're in the life-changing business. I'm glad, God, today you're in the turnaround business. You're in the second-chance business. And I'm grateful that, God, today you allow all of us to start over. You said today that your mercies are new. This is a day to start over. This is a day to begin anew. And I thank you that, God, you've not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through your son Jesus might be saved. God, move today. Have your will and way in this service. And God, in advance, we're going to thank you for what you do because it's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we all do pray. And everybody said, when you study the life of David, you always go back and you pick out your favorite story. And there's many stories about the life of David. You go to First and Second Samuel, you go to all through 150 Psalms, and you're going to find out that David is a very common man. But you read about David, and David is a young boy. And as a young boy, he's out there tending sheep. Tending sheep was not a very exciting job. Uh, you were ceremonially unclean. You couldn't go in the temple. You couldn't go in the synagogue. Nobody wanted to be around you because you smelled like those sheep. And if I read the Bible right, the Bible said all we like sheep. So it's referring to the fact that we're sheep. But if you've ever read about them, you're going to find out that sheep are not very bright. There's one commentator that says that sheep are so dumb that when they look up when it's raining, they get mesmerized by the drops, and if the shepherd doesn't come over and pop them on the head, they'll stand there and stare at those drops and drown. You say, who's that sound like? It sounds like us. David's out there tending those sheep. He doesn't even get to go to church, and the Bible said he's got some older brothers. There's six of them, and man, do they like themselves, and man, does their father Jesse like them, and the day comes when Samuel, the man of God, the prophet, comes into their house. And Samuel says today, one of your boys is going to be anointed the king over all of Israel. That would be like today somebody walking in your house, picking out one of your kids and saying, hey, in two weeks they're going to be president. By the way, that might not be a bad idea. (laughs) But then you say, wait, you you say they're going to anoint him the king. They've already got a king. His name is Saul. And Saul has lost his mind. But here's the thing about Saul. Saul is tall and bright and handsome and tall. Uh, He looks like a leader. And the Bible said that Saul is the people's choice. And yet God knows that he doesn't know God. He doesn't know the things of God. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about the people of God. Israel is absolutely going into a mess. So he goes out on the side of the hill and he says, go get uh, him and bring him in. And David comes walking in. All the other brothers have been rejected. And the minute he walks in, Samuel says, that's the boy. Arise. Anoint him. He is the king of Israel. So, so when you read that story, you say, what's he do? Does he take the throne? Does he say, hey, hey it's my job. And, hey, I'm going now. Saul, you hit the road. No, he doesn't do that. The Bible tells us he goes back to those sheep. He goes back as a shepherd. And then you go to the very next chapter, and the Bible begins to tell us about how he's growing and how he's forming and how God's moving in his life. And there's a day that comes that as a young boy, his father says, Hey, I want you to take these cheese sandwiches. I want you to go up there. I want you to watch the war. I want you to tell me how it's going. And David's so excited. He's heard his older brothers talk about war. He's heard his older brothers talk about Saul. And the Bible said he comes up over this hill. And the Bible said when he does it, there's a guy by the name of Goliath. 
Goliath is nine feet nine, 500 pounds. I mean, history says he was an unbeatable foe. And there he is standing up. And he's doing three things. Number one, he is defying the nation of Israel. Number two, he is defying Saul. And number three, more than anything else, he's defying God. And as he comes over that hill, the king Saul's doing nothing. His brothers are doing nothing. And the rest of the army is sitting there paralyzed. They're paralyzed by fear. I mean, he's roaring. He's got on this armor. He's got a shield bearer out in front of him. The sun is reflecting off of him at the just right time. It's going back in their face. And hey, they're absolutely locked down in fear. And David cannot understand it. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this that defies God? Who is this that defies our nation? Who is this that defies our king? And I said, well, do you want to fight him? And David tells the story, listen, I whipped a lion and I whipped a bear and I'm not afraid of him. And they said, well, come over here. Let's put on Saul's armor. Come over here. Let's get you dressed up so you can go out to battle. And the Bible says that he said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Give me five stones. Give me my slingshot. You see, there's a rumor that Goliath had four brothers. So he's taking a stone for every one of them. And when he gets out there, Goliath does something. Goliath does what all bullies do. You remember junior high? You remember the kid in the seventh grade that had a beard? Come on. <laughs> he is supposed to be a junior, but he's in the seventh grade, and he would terrorize you in the boys' bathroom. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about here? Boy, he had ch bullies do the same thing. They, they start talking, and they start threatening, and they start telling you what they're going to do to you. Well, the Bible said that Goliath does that very same thing to David. He said, man, why don't you send a man out here? Why don't you send that little boy? Why, why would you send this punk kid out here to fight me? I'm 9'9", nine, nine, I'm 500 pounds, I'm the baddest cat in the valley. Why would you do this? And for the first time in 40 days, somebody says something back. And it's David. You see, the Bible said he's small, he's ruddy, he's with all of a beautiful countenance. He's not very good at fighting as far as Goliath is concerned, but I'll tell you, it's the smallest kid in the class, he could talk some smack. And he said, hey, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. You mark this down. If God's on your side, you win. I said, if God's on your side, I don't care what Goliath says. I don't care about his armament. I'm telling you, God's on the throne, and God is in charge. And he whips Goliath. He cuts off his head. You know David's a good dude, because he's running around with that head saying, he's not here anymore. Come on, amen. And then there's a time when David, 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 finds himself in an absolute mess. And why does he find himself in an absolute mess? Because when he cut off Goliath's head, he got three things. Number one, he got rich. Number two, his daddy wasn't going to get taxed anymore. But number three, Saul gave David his daughter, Michael. If you've ever read the Bible, you realize that Michael was nobody's prize. Come on. You ever read that verse? There's several of them in Proverbs where Solomon, who had the, supposedly the wisest man in all the world, Solomon, who had over a thousand wives and concubines, Solomon said, it's better, I said, it's better to dwell on a rooftop than in a wide house with a brawling sister. Come on, amen. None of you men said amen there. Good job. Way to go, amen. But, but hey, she was trouble. She didn't know God. She didn't love David. She was set up as a pawn to spy on David. The time comes when after David cuts off Goliath's head, they start singing that David has killed his thousands, his thousands and Saul has, or excuse me, David has killed, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands. Nobody has ever done what David has done. And now the Bible tells us that his wife begins to tell. And his wife goes back, and David goes and gets her, which was a mistake. There's a biblical theological song about that. Thank God and Greyhound, she is gone. Amen. But he goes and gets her back. She spies on him some more. And then the Bible says that Saul needs some soothing. And David plays a stringed instrument. You talk about good. I'm telling you, he's alive right now. He'd be on the Grand Ole Opry. Amen. And Saul realizes, that's the kid that they're going to say takes my job. 
That's the one that says that, that they say has done greater exploits than me. And he takes a javelin and he throws it at David. And now David for 20 years runs. What's he running from? He's not afraid he cut off Goliath's head. He's not afraid. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a mighty man of God. Why is he running? You read about David. And you find out that David, as a man after God's own heart, wouldn't touch Saul. Saul was the king. David didn't want to be the king. David didn't ever seek out the king. The kingdom sought him out. And the Bible said that David and all of his mighty men, he's got hundreds of them now. And they're running from the law. They're running from their past. They're running from all the mess they've made in their lives. And they're hanging out with David. And they're hiding in a cave. And while they're hiding in that cave, guess who comes looking for David? It's Saul. It's all those armies. And when he gets in there, they're, they're crouched and they're hiding in the dark. And while they're hiding in the dark, his men are saying, There's the, there he is, there he is. Kill him, get your knife, kill him. The Bible said that David cuts off the bottom of his skirt, which, by the way, he's so uh, enamored with what God wants that, that it even makes him feel bad when he does that. And the Bible says the time comes when Saul gets up and walks out. His men are thinking, well, he brought him to you. He was supposed to be killed, and you let him go. And David comes running out, and he does something. He, he kneels down to the ground. He sticks his forehead on the ground, and he cries out, Saul, Saul, Saul. And Saul turns around, and he sees David. And he thinks, I've got him now. When David holds up that garment that he had just cut. Saul looks down at the bottom of his garment. It's been cut. He realizes that David, by mercy, had spared his life. He said, I'm not after your job. I didn't, I didn't seek it out. I'm a shepherd, man. And still for years, you find David running from Saul. Saul could not let it go. The Bible says, who? can stand before envy. You, you want somebody to hate you? Do better than them. You want somebody to hate you? Have more than them. You want somebody to hate you? Hey, live your life in a way that honors God. When they don't, they'll hate you for it. It just doesn't make sense. But that's exactly how Saul was. And then the time comes in David's life where he becomes the king. And he's on a rooftop. As he looks across that rooftop, there's a naked woman over there. Hey, hey, that's, that's Uriah's wife. Hey, hey, I know her daddy. I know her grandpa. I know him. And he thinks to himself, I should be at war. I, sh I should be out there with those men. Isn't it amazing? I mean, just go back in your mind. How many times have we gotten in a mess because we're at the wrong place? He should have been at war. But he's looking across that balcony. He calls to her. She calls back later and says, I'm a child. It can't be you, right? My husband's. He's at war. Uh, David, it's your child. And the misery of David's life begins because in Psalm 51, David says, man, uh, my, I, the Holy Spirit seems like it's left. I, I don't even know if I'm saved. You, you read about him in Psalm chapter 32 and he finds himself in an absolute upside down mess that he created. His son doesn't like him. His daughter gets raped. I mean, you, you look at his life, it's a mess. And because of this, he, he loses his moral authority, or at least he thinks he does. Hey, let me just give you a word right here. Just because you make a mistake doesn't mean your life is over. Come on. But he makes this mistake. And the Bible said that he's got this boy named Absalom. Powerful. Good looking. A leader. He's standing out there by the gates. And when people come walking in, he said, hey, hey, listen, if I was the king, hey, if I was there instead of my daddy, let me tell you exactly what would happen. But he's not. He just gets all the people on his side. And David, who has stood up to Goliath, won't stand up to his son. Did you hear me? He stood up to a nine foot nine, 500 pound giant, but he won't stand up to his own boy. And he tells the commander, Joab, Joab, go easy, don't hurt him. Don't, don't, don't kill him. But Joab kills him anyway. And Joab says, hey, all these other guys are defending you and taking care of you. And, and your boy's going to do this. And no, no. He kills him. And so there's a runner that comes running. And David thinks they're going to bring me a good word and tell me they've got uh, Absalom locked up. But no, no. The runner says that Absalom, your son, is dead. There is a club that nobody wants to be in. When as a parent, a child goes wayward. Or a child runs away. Or a child dies. Nobody wants to be in that. My friend Frank Johnson has a great statement. He says the level of your happiness as a parent 
will come up to the level of your least happy child. If your kids aren't happy, you're not happy. And now here's Absalom, he's dead. And what does David do? He goes on the rooftop and he cries, oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, I would to God, Absalom. I would to God that I had died for thee. He's a grieving dad. You say, how did they, how did they, what happened to David? What you read in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, which is Old Testament, and you read in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, and you know what it says about him? It says that David was a man after God's own heart. What was the difference between Saul and David? I mean, Saul was tall, bright, handsome, and good looking. Saul was a great leader. What was the difference between he and David? David small and ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance. What was the difference? I'll tell you what it was. It's the same difference in every life. And that is that when David messed up, David was willing to go to God, admit it, and repent. And Saul was not. Hey, nobody in this room, nobody is perfect. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. There's none righteous, no, not one. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You say, I'm black, I'm white, I'm brown, I'm yellow, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat. Hey, whatever you are, I'm telling you, we're all in the same category. And that is all of sin. Come on, amen. Everybody in this room is in the same dadgum spot we've all seen. But David would make it right. And David would repent. You see, I'm sorry. And God, forgive me. They go a long ways with God. And you say, well, if that worked for David, that also works for us. If God would let David repent, then surely God will let us repent. You see, here's Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been without the presence of God. And now what happens? They're going to take the Shekinah glory into the presence of God. They're going to take the presence of God into Jerusalem. You go to Jerusalem now, and you know what it's referred to? It's referred to as the city of David. I mean, David must have been somebody amazing. You think about all these years later, when you say Jerusalem, everybody will say it's the city of David. But now he's making his way back. He's the king, and what is he doing? He's taking the presence of God. Now, wait a minute. When he does this, Moses has put together the protocol given to him by God of how you're to take the Shekinah glory back in there. You see, the Bible said there's a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And there's two cherubims. And in between there was the presence of God. And all through the Old Testament, there was a process to get into the presence of God. You and I can get in the presence of God, praise God, because of Jesus. Amen. But in the Old Testament, there was a process. So what does he, he wants to take the presence of God to Jerusalem. And God says, hey, do it like the Levites. Put it on a pole, put some ringlets, and you carry it. Put a guy here, put a guy back here, put four guys and carry that in. You said, no, wait a minute, what did they do? They did it the Amalekite way. They put it on a cart, and they allowed an oxen to pull that cart. And the Bible says that when they got ready to do that, that they got to a place that dipped, and when it dipped, one of the guys reached over, grabbed the Ark of the Covenant, and put it back on that cart. And the second he did, he died. You say, why did he die? I'll tell you why he died. The same reason we die. He didn't do it God's way. Hey, God forgives. Come on, have we already established that? Say amen. amen. I'll tell you something else God does. You're his child. He demands something out of you. That he doesn't demand out of the rest of the world. See, Hebrews chapter 12 says, Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus went to a cross for you. Amen. amen. Jesus died on a cross for you. Amen. Jesus suffered on that cross for you. Now, wait a minute. Jesus now has some demands that he can rightfully make of our lives. You see, the Bible said if you be without chastisement, if you be without discipline, if you be without correction, it says then are you illegitimate. What's it mean? It means you don't live like hell and go to heaven. Come on. You remember when you were as a kid and your mama would say, come over here so I can slap you? Come on, how do you remember that? How many of you know you had a mother that at Thanksgiving reached for a roll and you ducked? Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? But why did she get by with that? My mama would get me in church, and if my hair wasn't just right, she would lick her hand and pat my hair. How many of you know I sit? Come on right now. She got by with it. Why? I'm your mother. I love you. I can't have you looking like your brother. Come on, everybody say yes. you get by with it. She loved you. Nobody, and I say nobody, has ever loved you like God. How did he love you? He let his son die on the cross in your place. 
Hey, he let Jesus die for us. You can't act like everybody else if you're a Jesus man. You can't act like everybody else if you're a Jesus woman. So they didn't do it just right. You see, there was no obedience. And what happened? Verse 10 says that David got fearful. Uh, he paralyzed. He took and gave the Ark of the Covenant, and he put it in Obed-Edom's house. That's what happens when you get afraid. That's what happens when you get out of God's will. You stop doing things God's way, and you get scared. And then what happens? There's the importance not only of being obedient, but listen to me, there's the importance of worship. Everybody say worship. John 4 and verse 24 says God is a spirit. I said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, when he saw that Obed-Edom was blessed for three months while the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God was there, it stirred David. Listen, if you live right, it'll stir those around you. Hey, if you act like you're a Jesus man, Jesus woman, if you'll get in your Bible, if you'll pray, if you'll go to church, hey, it'll be amazing what God will do for you too. Amen. It stirred him. And then... Excuse me, verse 13 says that God told him to explicitly obey. Explicitly obey. What does that mean? That means you do it God's way. They're 10 miles from Obed Edom's house all the way to Jerusalem. And he would take six steps one, two, three, four, five, six, and they'd do a sacrifice. One, two, three, four, five, six, and they'd do a sacrifice. How many of you know it would take you a dead gum long time if every six paces you had to give a sacrifice? Come on. But here's the deal. David wasn't playing games anymore. David was going to do it God's way. And then what happens in verse 14 and 15? I want you to see it again. The Bible said in verse 14, And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod, and David and all the house of the Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. You know what I know happens? When you walk with God and when God does something amazing in your life, you ought to tell the world God did it. Amen. The Bible says, let the redeemed, those that are saved, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He, he shouts. Hey, hey, verse 17, it's worth it all. Michael despises him. There's the blessing of the people. Hey, there's the blessing of the cultivated people that, hey, he wanted to know the presence of God. You celebrate. You celebrate when God does something amazing in your life. Especially when God does it. Can I get an amen right there? You know, God has a way of doing stuff that you don't even understand. God just does it. I said, God does it. God, God gets the glory, not man. Come on, amen. But like God's ordered some stuff this morning. I couldn't have ordered it. I couldn't have done it. Uh, down here, I've never told him about this and mentioned her name. But I know what, this morning when I walked in here and saw this, I said, God's in this. There's a lady that's a dear lady in our church, Miss Jackie Taylor. Jackie, raise your hand up. That's Jackie Taylor. You'd never know it. She's from Oklahoma. Can I get an amen right there? I mean, the best thing about Oklahoma Texans is we don't live there. Come on, everybody say amen. Yes. Outside of Jackie, if you see a good local looking woman in Oklahoma, she's a visitor. Come on, everybody stay with me here. She's told me I'm from Oklahoma. I am the queen of Oklahoma. God bless me, I'm from Oklahoma. Everybody say amen to that, yes. But her husband Pete was a special friend. And when I first came to church, oh, Pete would say, Brother Clark, I want to talk to you. And he'd come in my office and just sit down and talk. You've been around somebody that's just a faithful man of God. You ever just been around him? Didn't ask for any attention. Didn't ask for you to give him any special nothing. He just went on, God, preacher, I'm praying for you. Pete passed away. And, uh, he didn't go to a punishment, he went to a reward. Been a faithful Sunday school teacher, been a faithful daddy, been a faithful husband. Hey, been faithful to the church, faithful to his pastor, man, he's faithful. And Jackie walked in a day or two after he had passed away, and he did his funeral. And she, she put something on my desk. And she said, uh, I want you to have this. I said, well, what is it? She said, I know we're buying some property. I know we're going to build some buildings. And she said, I want to be the first one to give something to that property and something to that building. I've never told that to anybody. 
but I'm telling you. Because I walked in this morning, and in 15 years of pastoring this church, she's never sat on the second row in the history of her life. <laughs> she's back there with you pagans. Can I just tell you where she sits? <laughs> but I knew, Jackie, when you sat out in there. I, I said, I didn't order that. And there's a guy sitting behind her named Anthony. It was on the back side of this property one day, and it was when I first got here, and we had little bitty thin asphalt, and he had driven a big old truck on that asphalt, and I didn't go out there to witness to him. I went out there to whip him. Can I get an amen on it? Yes. I couldn't have whipped him, but I was mad enough to try it, all right? And I said, hey, Anthony, you know what you need? You need to get yourself back over here in this church. That's what you need. Well, three or four weeks later, he came. He was in one of those outfits that you wear when you're working out there in the yard. He's sitting on the back row in a pair of faded jeans, a t-shirt, and pink glasses. How many know I think I got Pink Floyd back on the back row? How many know him? I said, Anthony, if you died today, you know where you'd go? He said, I used to think so. Long story short, he came back six weeks later, brought his wife, Carrie, brought his son, Kodiak. He said, I'm saved. He told me how he'd been saved. And in the process of all this, in the process of all this, these two people that I didn't arrange to sit down here by each other, she started our giving. And Anthony and his company, there's a bunch of people that come in today from all over the country to be here. In the course of the last five years, something, she started it off, Jackie started it off, but that company has given us almost $13 million. Amen. Tell me what's amazing about this. Jackie gave a widow's mite. That's as much as anything Anthony's ever given. You say, how's that work? I tell you how it works. God does it. He uses people. I mean, he uses people. Hey, hey, and here's the deal. Here, hey, here's what'll happen. Some preacher's gonna find out tomorrow that uh, this last week we got six million dollars. Can I just tell you, six million dollars will change your personality? Can I just, hey, man, yes. <laughs> and they're gonna get mad because we got Michael. When she saw David dancing, she despised him. Let me tell you what you're gonna do when you walk out of here. You're gonna tell the whole world, I don't care what everybody else says. God is blessing and moving in the Willow Park Baptist Church. You say, is one gift bigger than the other? Not according to God. There have been so many people that have blessed us and done amazing stuff, things for us. And, and then the Bible says not only did they worship, not only did he dance, but lastly the Bible said he had humility. He bowed down and said, God, I'm just going to give you that. I want you to see something. Look at verse 20. You got your Bibles? Go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Look at verse 20. It says, then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaidens of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house and to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I pray, play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus and will be based in mine own sight, and of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. Three things, and I'm done. In your life, in my life, in our church's life, number one, we can either get better or we can get better. Devil's going to try and wreck you. He's going to try and ruin you. You had something good come in, he'll try and ruin it. He is a liar. You're either going to get better or you're going to get better. Number two, the better you know where you stand before the Lord, the freer you can become. If God be for you, who can be against you? You say, God doesn't care about me. Hey, God cares enough about you. He put his only son on a cross. He cares about you. 
And the more you walk with the Lord, the freer you're going to be. Number three, the freer you are before the Lord, the more confident you'll become in your life. You know what Jeremiah 29 says? He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards thee, thoughts of good and not evil, to give you an expected or a great end. What's that mean? The best part of your life can be from here till eternity. The best part of your life can start today. You say, how's it start? Number one, you got to know that you know Jesus. Don't play games with that one. Come on. Number two, if you know Jesus, make things right. What was the difference between Saul and David? Saul was in love with himself, and David was in love with God. And David was willing to repent. You need to get better better. The better you know the stand, you're standing before the Lord, the freer you become, the freer you become, the more confident you'll become in your life. Would you bow your heads for just a moment?